All right. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for your um, your patience. I have a statement um, on the situation in uh, Gaza and Israel. The Secretary General appeals to all parties to immediately cease the fighting in Gaza and Israel. The ongoing military escalation has caused great suffering and destruction. It has claimed scores of civilian lives, including, tragically, many children. The fighting has the potential to unleash an uncontainable security and humanitarian crisis and to further foster extremism, not only in the occupied Palestinian territory in Israel, but in the region as a whole. The parties must allow for mediation efforts to intensify with a view to ending the fighting immediately. The UN is actively involved in such efforts, which are also crucial for delivering much needed humanitarian aid to the affected people in Gaza. The Secretary General reiterates that only a sustainable political solution will lead to lasting peace. He reiterates his commitment, including through the Middle East Quartet, to supporting Palestinians and Israelis to resolve the conflict on the basis of the relevant UN resolutions, international law, and bilateral agreement. And I, in addition to that statement, I have a humanitarian update uh, from our col uh, humanitarian colleagues uh, who report from Gaza that given limited fuel reserves in the Gaza Strip, there are now daily rolling electrical power cuts, 8 to 12 hours a day. Another 230,000 people from Gaza City and Khan Yunis have limited access to piped water due to increasing power cuts and damage to the network. Over 12,000 people have reportedly sought shelter from the fighting, with many situated in schools run by our colleagues at UNRWA. 29 UNRWA schools in Gaza have been opened as designated emergency shelters for uh, displaced people. UNRWA and humanitarian partners are providing food, water, and non-food items to those people. As previously mentioned, funding for the humanitarian appeal for the occupied Palestinian territory is only 29 percent funded. And the Secretary General has just concluded his visit to Moscow. Earlier today, he met Prime Minister Mikhail uh, Mishustin for discussions on a wide range of issues, including climate and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you will have seen in a readout we issued yesterday, the Secretary General also had a virtual meeting with President Vladimir Putin. Uh, they discussed um, a number of international and regional peace, security, and humanitarian issues, and the need to resolve conflict through political dialogue, mutual respect, and understanding. They also talked about the importance of renewed commitment to multilateralism, solidarity, and cooperation for the international community to address the unprecedented global challenges in the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. The Secretary General expressed the interest of the UN to deepen its cooperation with the Russian Federation in the three pillars of the organization's work, peace and security, sustainable development, including climate change and biodiversity, and human rights. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, the, um, sorry, and I just want to flag that the this morning, the Secretary General also had a meeting with the Speaker of the Federation Council of the Federal Assembly, Valentina Mativienko. They discussed climate issues, gender, and other topics. And yesterday, the Secretary General received a honorary degree from a Moscow University, and all of that information was shared with you. Also, just want to flag and put into the record our senior personnel announcement, which we put out yes, uh, Wednesday afternoon, and that is that the Secretary General has appointed Martin Griffiths of the United Kingdom as Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. He will succeed, as you know, Mark Lowcock, to whom the Secretary General is deeply grateful for his dedicated service to the UN, as well as his commitment in mobilizing assistance and resources to protect and alleviate the conditions of many people impacted by humanitarian crises. Um, we will uh, just also just to note that Mr. Uh, Griffiths, who is, you know, is the current special envoy for Yemen, uh, he will continue to serve in that position until a transition uh, plan has been announced. And from Myanmar, our colleagues on the ground tell us that more than 100 days 
on from the military takeover. Uh, the, the situation, they remain very concerned over the military's restrictive policies and practices towards media outlets. Uh, the UN team urges the military to release all, pe all people detained arbitrarily, including the journalists that have been jailed. To date, the military has revoked the operating licenses of eight media outlets, while at least 84 journalists have been arrested. Of those, at least 48 remain in detention as of today. A journalist uh, was found guilty and jailed for three years earlier this week. Our colleagues say that the freedom of expression and the press are fundamental human rights underpinning all civil liberties and must be protected. Uh, and staying on a related topic, next Tuesday, on May 18th, the 2021 Joint Response Plan for the Rohingya Humanitarian Crisis will be launched, and that will be hosted by the government of Bangladesh, along with the UN Refugee Agency and the International Organization for Migration. That plan will target nearly 1.4 million people, and that's Rohingya refugees themselves, and of course the host communities. This year, uh, it brings together the efforts of the government of Bangladesh and 134 UN agencies and NGO partners. As you'll recall, some 740,000 Rohingyas fled from violence in Myanmar's Rakhine State in 2017. UNHCR says that with the refugee crisis in its fourth year, Bangladesh needs robust and sustained international support to ensure the safety and well-being of stateless Rohingya refugees. This must not become a forgotten crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has compounded the vulnerabilities of both refugees and communities hosting them. Uh, we'll have more on that uh, online. And a few COVID COVAX rather, uh, updates. Bosnia and Herzegovina received this week's three additional shipments of COVAX -Vax Pfizer vaccines, which amounts to a little over 150,000 doses. Those complement uh, other vaccines the country is receiving from separate agreements. The UN team is also delivering over 11 million pieces of life-saving medical equipment, testing kits, and necessary supplies. And Georgia has also uh, received a second shipment of over 400, or excuse me, of over 43,000 uh, vaccines, about half of the total expected through COVAX. Authorities there expect to vaccinate 60% of the 3.7 million people by the end of the year. UN entities also procured and delivered essential supplies, including hospital equipment, PPE, test kits, lab consumables, computers, and vital medical supplies. And in Egypt, uh, the COVAX facility delivered an additional 1.7 million doses of the vaccine yesterday, in addition to over 850,000 that had received in March. Finally, Costa Rica yesterday received its second batch of vaccines. That's nearly 90,000 doses. And an update from India, where our UN team there continues to provide equipment and supplies for the pandemic response. This includes 72 oxygen generating plants, 13,000 concentrators, and over 400,000 COVID testing kits. 85 testing machines have been installed in labs across the country. The UN team is also uh, supporting migrants and vulnerable groups by setting up uh, helplines to provide psychosocial support and information on social welfare and livelihood opportunities. Our team is also helping authorities to care for children who have lost both parents due to the pandemic. The resident coordinator, Renata Desalian, said today that the COVID-19 wave has caused unfathomable suffering and loss for the people of India. She noted that the, these, the Indian people have responded with extraordinary acts of altruism, selflessness, courage, and ingenuity, as well as mutual help. The resident coordinator stressed that the UN team in India stands with the people and the government. And a few international days to flag. Uh, tomorrow is the International Days of Families. The theme this year is Families and New Technologies. Sunday is the International Day of Living Together in Peace. It's an important day. Uh, the day aims to uphold the desire to live and act together, un, uh, united in differences and diversity, in order to build a sustainable world of peace, solidarity, and harmony. And Sunday is also the International Day of Light. The day celebrates the, new, the role light plays in science, culture, and art, education, sustainable development, in the fields as diverse as medicine, communications, and energy. Uh, speaking of energy. Speaking of light. Not be, yeah, speaking of, no, I'll, go ahead. 
Thank you, Stefan. Uh, so uh, I see that in the Secretary General uh, talks about Gaza and Israel in his statements mm -hmm. yesterday and today. Does he, uh, or does this mean that he sees that the escalation is separate from uh, what's happening in the West Bank, but not also the West Bank, uh, also cities and, and towns in, in Israel? Look, I, I think the, the, we're focused on Gaza because that's where we've seen, obviously, the most uh, dramatic increase uh, in the conflict. Uh, we're also very much concerned about the situation uh, in the West Bank. We've seen uh, casualties both from Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, we are, dis despite, I would say, the security, uh, as much as the security situation allows, uh, we are providing assistance as required, uh, humanitarian as required, to uh, Palestinian families in the West Bank. But it's important. The, the continued fighting, um, uh, the continued fighting, is uh, hampers our operation and is obviously of concern. And we're obviously also uh, very much concerned is about the the, the 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 violence we've seen between uh, different communities uh, in Israel, and we would appeal for calm on that front. And the follow up also, um, the Israeli Prime Minister the use of uh, administrative detention um, in, in Lud uh, city. Um, do you have a position on this measure, which is usually, uh, uh, it means a detention without a trial? What's your position on that? Look, uh, you know, there is a, uh, there is obviously a, um, a tense security situation. We, as a matter of, I'm not going to get into the the weeds of the, of what uh, what is going on directly in in Israel. But obviously, we, we as a matter of principle, stand for uh, for most fairness, injustice, and and people, you know, if they're detained, that they need to face uh, face whatever charges. Uh, Miss Salome, please. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Um, I'm struck by the fact that it was just one week ago that the Security Council held this mm -hmm. meeting on multilateralism, and all members of the Council came out and expressed their support for it. And yet, we've seen in the last week Council members blocking action uh, that other Council members support, whether it's Myanmar, Palestine, or what have you. Is the Secretary General worried? that the inconsistencies of what these permanent members of the council say and do undermines the, sec the, the United Nations to the core? Uh, what's the point of multilateralism if one country can block an issue of concern for all others? Look, I mean, I think the Secretary General would be the first one to tell you, and he has said it, that he's concerned about the state of multilateralism. Uh, as we've seen it during the pandemic and as we've seen it uh, in, in, in other aspects. Um, we would like to see member states um, put to uh, action the ideals that we all have to live up to uh, within, this, uh, within this organization. The, the more unified the Security Council is, the stronger its voice and the stronger its impact. Let's go to Alan, then we'll go uh, to the screen for a bit, and then we'll come back in the room. Sorry. Uh, a source in uh, Turkey foreign ministry told RIA Novosti recently that uh, members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation advocate for establishing so-called mechanism of protection for Palestinians, which would imply sending an international military force to the region. Your position on such a statements uh, and initiatives? Yeah, I, I'm not going to to comment on whatever is leaked from an organization that I don't uh, that I don't speak uh, for. Our uh, our aim right now is for a de-escalation, an immediate cessation of hostilities. Um, we need to get humanitarian aid uh, to those who need it, and we need to get a political process uh, back on track. 
Uh, I'll come back to you in a second. Let's go to James Reinald and then Abdul Hamid and then Joe Klein. Um, thank you, Stefan. Uh, I've got two questions. First one's group of them is going to be on the meeting with Putin and then all the next stuff on COVID. But first of all, on Putin, Mr. Guterres flew all the way to Moscow and had a virtual meeting with Mr. Putin. What's that about? Because it sounds like a bit of a snub. And did, uh, is Mr. Guterres now, um, uh, does he feel that he has the support of the Russian leader in his quest for a second term? On your second part of your first question, it's not for me to speak uh, for, for, the, for candidate Guterres. Uh, it's not for me to, it's not any question for me to answer. Uh, on your first part, no, we don't take it as a snub. Uh, the, the meeting, the, we've had a number of meetings with the foreign minister, Mr. Lavrov. That's the way the, our Russian host organized uh, the meeting, I think, as it's been done in, in other occasions. Uh, I think we were very pleased to have, Secretary General was very pleased to have quite a long conversation uh, with President Putin. Thanks so much. And on COVID, um, uh, yesterday, President Joe Biden and the CDC said in the US, if you've been double vaccinated and had those two weeks, you can be inside a building and you don't have to wear your face mask. Is that now the rule at UN headquarters? Can we demask? No, that's uh, not yet the rule at UN headquarters. We obviously, uh, like, like everybody who lives in the US, I think we're uh, happy to hear uh, the message from the from the White House. We're obviously now in contact with our host city, the host state, because they are, given the federal nature of the government in this country, uh, there are different regulations uh, for the states, for the city. Uh, we're, we're all looking at that, but obviously it's a very positive, uh, it's a very positive signal uh, for everyone here. Uh, Mr. Klein, and then Abdel Hamid, and then Mr. Toby. Yes, hi, Stefan. I hope you're feeling better. Um, Thank you. I have uh, two questions. I have two questions, which I hope will not give you a relapse. Or, anyways. Well, I mean, uh, I'm already sitting down, so the next step is lying down. So, but let's go ahead. Okay. First, first question: um, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad leaders have have said and expressed their gratitude to Iran for supplying much of their weaponry, uh, funds, and other support. And the um, a senior official of the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps of Iran uh, was quoted just very recently as saying, quote, we have a religious duty to act against Israel and annihilate it. So then we have, we have the, um, uh, the Palestinian uh, groups in Gaza using weaponry from Iran and a senior Islamic Revolution Guard Corp official saying that Iran's policy is essentially to annihilate Israel. Uh, I'd like to comment uh, on behalf of the Secretary General on that, and then I have another question. Well, I mean, uh, you know, on the statements about annihilation, uh, we stand clearly in condemnation of any sorts of statements to, to that effect, and we have done so in the past and will continue to do so. Uh, I have no particular information on, on weapons where they, where they come from. What is clear for us is that every country, whether it is in the region and beyond, should use its influence on the parties uh, to bring about peace, uh, to bring about a cessation of hostilities, to bring about a de-escalation, um, and to help uh, calm the situation. Your second question. Yeah, my second question is, uh, goes to the Secretary General vision statement. You've said on several occasions that the Secretary General keeps his re-election campaign entirely separate from his official duties as Secretary General. Uh, do you know uh, who helped the Secretary General prepare, if anyone, uh, his, I think it was 17-page uh, vision statement? Is there anybody on the Secretary's staff? My understanding is all of that work has been done through the Portuguese mission. And obviously by him, but it's, it's, his, uh, it's his vision. Um, okay, uh, Abdel Hamid and then Toby. 
thank you, Sita. And I was listening to the statement issued by the Secretary General, and I found it was inaccurate and unbalanced. And let me just quote what the Israeli army said. It's a statement from the Israeli army. It said that 160 fighting jets had conducted, uh, had fired 450 missiles, 450 missiles against 150 targets in 40 minutes. And not one word mentioned about the disproportionate use of force. Why is that? Why the word this, uh, disproportionate use of force has, was missing from the statement? The statement exactly equal, equal, equalized between both sides, exactly, word for word, full drafted statement to equalize between both parties. Why is that? Look, we have been, have we have been very clear on a number of points. One is for Israel uh, to use restraint and to calibrate uh, the use uh, the the use of force in its uh, in its uh, security operations. We have also condemned uh, the uh, use of of rockets uh, firing indiscriminately into civilian areas by uh, by militant groups, whether Hamas. Or, or others. What we want to see is an end to the civilian suffering. We want to see an end to the destruction that we are seeing now. And that is the aim of what we say publicly, and it is the aim of our diplomatic activity. Your second question. Uh, just as a follow-up to what you just said, the word condemn was used only once against the Palestinians, but when uh, a residential tower was destroyed to the ground. It was not used to were condemned. But my, my second question, as of today, 119 Palestinians killed, including 31 children, 31 children, I repeat that, 31 children and 19 women. Do these victims, the 31 children and 19 women, worth the sta a statement that condemn, they use the word condemn of those who they use excessive force to kill these children and women? We have consistently spoken out and condemned uh, the, the death of all civilians. Okay, Toby. It's so frustrating. Toby. Thanks, uh, thanks, Seth. Um, first question is, what does the Secretary General expect from the Security Council meeting on the situation in Israel and Palestine uh, that's happening this weekend? It's a Sunday meeting. I think the last time we had a Sunday meeting was probably North Korea stuff in 2017. Um, but what, is, what does he expect? And is anyone from the Secretariat briefing on Sunday? Yes, there will be a, a Secretariat briefer. We're working out those details uh, as we speak. What we would like to see is a, like I've said before, is a strong unified voice uh, for de-escalation, for a cessation of hostilities, and a push to get the parties uh, back on track to find a political solution uh, to this conflict that has been going on and on and on. Sorry, sorry Steph. I, your first uh, statement I didn't hear it's, so the details are being uh, worked out on who the briefer is? That's correct. Uh, well, we should have some more information by the end of the day. And then so, uh, just one other question on, uh, does, does Mr. Wenisland uh, use these moments, does he think these are moments are opportunities for uh, renewed action and diplomacy on his part? Or is he waiting for this situation to die down before he really approaches the political side of this? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I would hate to, to, to say that uh, moments when we're seeing scores of children, civilians die as an opportunity. Uh, but that being said, he has been actively uh, involved in contacts with all the relevant parties, uh, whether it's on the ground or his quartet colleagues. Uh, and so the, the diplomacy is very much uh, at work. Okay, we'll go to Maggie, and then we'll go back to Nabil. Hey, Steph. Um, could you tell us specifically what the Secretary General has been doing to get the quartet meeting convened, and 
who he's spoken to on the phone? Has he called Prime Minister Netanyahu or Mahmoud Abbas? Who is he speaking to specifically? Thanks. No. Yeah, so, so go ahead. I know before, uh, I mean, I spoke to him just before he got on his plane to Moscow. He's been having been in constant contact with uh, Mr. Uh, with his special coordinator, Mr. Vanislan, who is himself in touch with all the relevant parties. Uh, and the Secretary General has had other contacts, uh, but I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any direct phone calls he's had uh, with either the Prime Minister of Israel or the, the President of the Palestinian Authority. And obviously the, uh, obviously the issue... Uh, sorry. How soon you'd get the court tip? Uh, no, sorry, no, there is, there, is no, uh, there is no timeline uh, that I'm able to share. And obviously he did uh, the discussion, the situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory was on the agenda of both his conversations with Pro uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov as well as President Putin. Okay, uh, Nabil and then Alan. <clears throat> I have uh, three questions. Uh, so why the Secretary General is not planning to brief the Security Council on Sunday? I, if, I didn't say he wasn't. I just said I will, will, we're working out the logistics of who will brief uh, on Sunday. So it is possible that he will be the briefer? Tons of things are possible. Okay. And also uh, the safety and, and security of journalists and media crews in Gaza and the West Bank because uh, our office, uh, in, among many others, was destroyed in Gaza, uh, my TV station. And uh, in the West Bank, also, the journalists are subject to attacks and harassments from the Israeli uh, forces. What's your message on this? Jur journalists, especially in zones of conflict, uh, do critical work. They need to be able to do their work uh, free of harassment of any kind, and in no way should they ever be targeted. And also a question about the southern, uh, southern Lebanon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. There was an incident today. Uh, what's your update on this? What, which incident are you referring uh, to? Uh, on the blue line, uh, mm -hmm. there was also a Lebanese casualty. Uh, a man was died because of the shooting from the Israeli side. Yeah, we're aware of that particular incident. I was just, uh, I just found about as I was uh, slowly walking in here. Uh, we are checking with our colleagues at UNIFIL on that. Thank you. Okay, Alan. Thank you. I have a little follow up on the question of quartet meeting. Today, um, the German foreign minister official said that uh, it's expected to be held today, but he didn't mention on what level. Do you have anything on this? No, I'm not aware of, uh, of a quartet meeting being held today. I checked uh, following your, you, the fact when you contacted me this morning with our colleagues in Jerusalem, they were not aware of an official uh, quartet uh, meeting. Obviously, the quartet envoys, are, I mean, let me put it this way. We are, our quartet representative, Mr. Venislan, is speaking to his, uh, his colleagues, but I'm not aware of an official quartet meeting. It, any level. Okay. Uh, thank you all. See you Monday. Enjoy the well. Good question. Uh, Sorry, Stefan, I put my name for a second question. Okay, one second, Abdel Hamid, I'll get you. Let me answer Nabil, then I'll get to you. Is Mr. Wanislin planning to visit Gaza? Uh, I have no, uh, this very moment, uh, I doubt it, given that the, uh, uh, the conflict is still ongoing, but I know he would uh, if he if he needs to, he would do so at his earliest possible convenience. Yes, Abdel Hamid. Yes, uh, two brief questions. Uh, first, why you say the president of Palestinian Authority? I mean, officially, the UN considers Abbas as the president of the state of Palestine. And when Riyadh Mansour speaks, yes, in okay, I, I, he has a uh, uh, sign says state of Palestine. Okay, I, so that, that, was a, that was that was a miss that was misspeaking on. Uh, that was just me speaking off the cuff. I should not be uh, uh, considering no anything problem. else. But my question is, in 1950, sorry, it passed a law denying the Palestinians who own property in the so-called, in, uh, in Israel, to seek uh, regaining their property. In 1970, Israel passed another law allowing Jews who have uh, previous, before 1948, any property 
in now what is the West Bank to seek to try to get back their power. Isn't that a, a flagrant case of apartheid? There are a lot of issues that will need to be dealt with uh, politically uh, between the parties so we can have two states, Israel and Palestine, living in peace side by side. The issue of property will clearly uh, be one of those issues. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we will keep you updated as to what happens on Sunday, but my understanding is that the meeting anyway will be all virtual, uh, so we have no plans to physically be here. Uh, but we'll keep you posted on our participation in that meeting. Will we have access to the building for those of us who need to I think, yeah, I think the, the check with Malu, but that should not be an issue.